Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. From Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Richard Woodmark in Doubtful Valley on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, this is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we give you the kind of story that has become part of our American folklore, the kind of story popularly called a Western. And popularly is the word, for Westerns appeal to nearly everybody. There's something clean and enchanting in their open-air scenery, something spring-like and vigorous in the plots they unfold. And if the good men and the bad men in them are easy to distinguish, that too can suit us in certain modern moods. Our story tonight is called Doubtful Valley, and it's based on the novel by George Garland. Its background is the wild and wonderful West. Its time is around 70 years ago, when the Apache War was at its height, and when the United States Cavalry were the heroes who saved the occasion. In our starring role tonight, we have that exciting young actor, Richard Widmark. And now, here is Frank Goss, from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you're looking for something to say to someone you care for, look for a Hallmark card and you'll find the right words. Because Hallmark cards are designed to say what you want to say, the way you want to say it, and in the good taste you demand of anything that bears your personal signature. That's why Hallmark on the back of a greeting card has come to mean you cared enough to send the very best. And now Hallmark Playhouse presenting George Garland's Doubtful Valley, starring Richard Widmark. This is the story of Doubtful Valley, a story like so many that were true stories 70 years ago. In those days, the Apaches were on the warpath in the western wilds. They were using army guns and rifles, and the colonel who had to bring law and order to the territory sent to New Orleans for a man named Jeff Cole. I rode into Fort Baird on the Santa Fe stage one morning and reported, as I'd been instructed, to Colonel Burnside. So you're Jeff Cole? Yes, sir. Dylan at Santa Fe suggested you for what I've got in mind. I'm told you've got quite a reputation for a cool head and a ready gun. That's what I need right now. What's your problem, Colonel? Have you ever been to a place called Doubtful Valley? Once, a long time ago. That's Apache country. Yes, that's Apache country. And every prospector, rancher, townsman, everyone in that valley is living on borrowed time at the moment. The chief of the Apaches, Chief Zoo, looks down on Doubtful Valley from the White Rocks. Looks down, watches, waits, and suddenly hundreds of Apaches pour down from all sides. We can't fight Zoo. He's got us outnumbered by thousands. Well, where do I come in, Colonel? I'd like to talk peace with Chief Zoo. I'd like you to do it for me. You lived with the Apaches for a while, didn't you? Yes, I was captured by them as a boy. Can you speak their language? I can. As a matter of fact, Chief Zoo can talk English. But I don't know whether they'll listen to me. You know what they say, Colonel. An Indian never broke a peace, and a white man never kept one out here. Yes, yes, that's true enough. I won't deny it. But if peace is made in my name, I'll see that it's kept. Call. those Apaches are fighting with army guns. Someone's hijacking our supplies and selling them to the Indians. I want to know who they are. I want them cleaned out. Well, I tell you, Colonel, I like to work free. And I'm not tackling anything where I'm hamstrung by military rules and red tape. So I reckon I'm not your man. Now listen here, Cole. I want a job done. I'm not telling you how to do it. You get me face to face with Chief Zoo, and I'll make a peace treaty and guarantee it. And you get me those gun runners, and you can name your own price. All right. 
You let me do it my own way, and it's a deal. Oh, incidentally, see what you can find out about the activities of a man named Norris over in Angel. He owns half the town. Norris? You know him? No, but his daughter was on the stagecoach. Quite a beauty. Did you get acquainted? No, I didn't. But I sure mean to. When I got back on the stagecoach headed for Angel, Kathy Norris was still on it. And an army captain had joined her. I wished them good morning, and to my surprise, Kathy spoke. Good morning, Mr. Cole, isn't it? Yes, it is. How'd you know? I heard someone speak to you when you got off the coach at Fort Bay. Oh. This is my fiancé, Captain Edler. What takes you to Angel, Mr. Cole? Oh, just thought I'd like to see what was going on in town, Captain Edler. Angel's not very friendly towards strangers. We had a lot of trouble with gun runners out there. Thanks for the warning. I'll sure watch my step, Captain. It was easy to see there wasn't going to be any love loss between Captain Edler and myself. We'd nothing further to say on the trip to Angel. It was dark when we arrived, but I saw that most of the buildings bore the name Norris. And I gathered that Kathy's father was a man of some influence in town. I headed for the hotel. The lobby was pretty well filled with cowboys, miners, and prospectors. So I sat down to look them over and be looked over. And in a minute or two, a young cowpuncher and a middle-aged man sauntered over. What's your business here, stranger? Business? Well, you see, uh, I got into a little trouble. Should have hanged for it, but the uh, jury came out and gave me a choice of 30 years in prison or six months in Angel. Like a fool, I took Angel. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody makes fun of me. Reach or draw, stranger. I don't draw, cowboy. Now, wait a minute, Robust. Let's find out who he is. Always like to know who it is we're bearing. Well, who are you? Jeff Call's the name. I said to draw, stranger. Sorry to shoot your gun out of your hand, cowboy, but I don't feel like shooting it out with you tonight. <laughs> yeah, it's the first time any man did that to me. You're all right. My name's Hewitt. I'm glad to meet you, Hewitt. I'm Jeff Call. Reckon I was lucky. No, no, reckon not. I was too darn lucky for luck. <laughs> Mr. Call, my name's Petaway. I published the Angel Clarion. Glad to know you, Mr. Petaway. Well, nice shooting, young man. And this here's Mr. Norris. You may have noticed his name on some of the buildings as you rode into town. Howdy, Mr. Norris. Well, that was quite an exhibition of shooting, Mr. Call. <laughs> you staying in these parts? I sure am. Well, watch that trigger finger. We like things peaceful in Doubtful Valley. That was Saturday. By Sunday, I had a horse. And before dawn, I started toward the mountains to try and make contact with the Apache Chief Zoo. I rode several miles out of town, then I stopped to build a signal fire. As soon as the fire was strong enough, I signaled my message to the Indian sentinels that I knew would be watching. White man alone on peace mission, unarmed. A short time later, I saw a puff of smoke further up the canyon, and I knew I'd contacted the messengers of Zoo. Then I took off my guns, laid them beside the fire, and I rode up into the canyon. I'd gone only a little way when I heard the sound of gunfire behind my back. I turned and I saw a handful of soldiers firing at the trees behind me. Loud yells echoed down the canyon and arrows sang past my ears. I had no chance of talking to the Indians now. I'd be lucky if I escaped with my life. Somehow, some way, I managed to get out of the canyon. I caught up with the soldiers some miles away. Captain Edler was their leader. I jumped off my horse and I ran towards him. What the blazes do you mean, firing up that canyon like that? Since I'm in charge of the army here, perhaps you'll tell me what you were doing in that canyon, Mr. Cole. You found my guns. You knew I was unarmed. Why did you fire? I fired at Indians. You didn't see Indians until after you fired. Are you calling me a liar? It sounds that way, doesn't it? Would you care to settle this with guns? I don't kill soldiers. Maybe not directly. Maybe you just furnished Zoo with the guns to do it. Yes, you'd like to think that, wouldn't you? You'd like everybody to think it. A man's got to be pretty sure of how he stands to go into Indian territory unarmed. Edler, I'm warning you. Don't get in my way. And I'm warning you, Cole. 
Get out of this country. Hello there, Jeff Cole. Oh, hello, Miss Norris. The name's Kathy. We're not much on formality out here. Thanks. <laughs> well, what are you doing out here at sundown? I'm riding back to town. Just kind of taking my time, doing some thinking. You want to stop here a minute? It's a good place to let the horses drink. Why not? <laughs> Jeff? Hmm? I've been doing some... some wondering about you. Really? Yes. I've been hearing a lot of things. You mean you heard I've been smuggling guns to the Indians? Well, yes. Do you believe it? No. Why not? I... I, I don't know. Kathy, are you really going to marry Edler? I thought I was. But no, I, I don't know. I must get home. Father will be wondering where I am. All right. <laughs> Jeff? Hmm? Don't go up in the canyon again. I'm going again tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, Jeff, that's suicide. Maybe, maybe not, but I've got to go. Jeff, what is your business with Zoo? Peace, Kathy. Believe me, that's what it is. Peace. The next morning before dawn, I started for the canyon again. I had no idea that Captain Edler and his men were following me. As before, I left my guns outside the canyon. Then I went up into the canyon, dismounted, and waited. Suddenly, I heard the sound I'd waited for. Several dozen Indians stood before me. And when they parted ranks, there was the great chief zoo himself. He was in full war paint, and he stared at me with cold suspicion. He pointed questioningly at my white flag, and I answered the unspoken question. I do not come with guns. I come to talk peace. Peace is for old women and children. Zoo does not trust white man's peace. He's like iron hook for fish. Apache by guns, keep land. The men who sell zoo guns are enemies of white men. We'll hunt them down. The men who sell guns are friends of Apache. You talk peace and threaten to banish friends in same talk. Yes. If a warrior breaks your laws, do you treat him as a brother? White men do not keep word. They are bad white men just as they are bad Indians. The great chief of white army wants to come and talk lasting peace with Zoo. Why should Apache make peace? Because you are few and we are many. You cannot win. You come alone. You know how we treat prisoners. Yes, I know. But I'm not afraid. Hmm. You brave. The brave are honest. I know you now. I see you many seasons ago. You live with Apache. You friend of Apache. I'm friend of Apache. Tell your braves. Bring your chief. I hope he is brave also. I talk to him. I talk to him at Apache camp. <coughs> you betray us. Again, we are betrayed. Oh, Sue, I came alone. Fire on the white devil! I didn't plan to kill! 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 I didn't plan to kill! Sue, some torch with his knife in his hands. And behind him, the army soldiers battling with the Indians. I knew that everything I'd bargained for was lost. And then Sue flung himself upon me, and I fell and I rolled down. Down into black. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Doubtful Valley, starring Richard Widmark. 
You know, every once in a while, you and I are given a golden opportunity to make up for forgotten duties, to show our love and gratitude to a special person in a special way. Just such an opportunity is coming up for all of us in a short time. Mother's special day will be here soon. Yes, Mother's Day, May 11th, is less than a month away. I'm mentioning it now because I'm sure you will want to make your selection early while you have your choice of all the Hallmark cards for Mother's Day. However you want to express your feelings, you'll find a card that is just right. From amusing, affectionate ones to flower-laden cards so deeply loving, they will have a special significance to Mother the whole year through. And there are cards to Mother and Father to let Dad share the day. Cards for Grandmother and Mother-to-be. Cards for every mother on Mother's Day. And you can be sure a Hallmark card has the very words to say for you whatever you have in your heart. The things you may find hard to say the way you would like to say it. So don't forget, stop in tomorrow at the fine store where you buy Hallmark cards. And be sure to look for the Hallmark on the back of the card you select. That Hallmark which says, you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton in the second act of Doubtful Valley, starring Richard Widmark. The last thing Jeff remembered was rolling down the canyon, and then everything in his eyes and mind came to a sudden stop. When he regained consciousness, he found himself in the Norris house, and Kathy was bending over him. I kept my eyes closed. I could hear voices in the room, and I wanted to know what would be said. Is he conscious? No, he isn't, Father. He's lucky if he pulls out of this alive. He's on borrowed time. What do you mean, he's lucky, Captain Edler? He wouldn't be in the trouble he's in if you hadn't fired at the Indians. He's a fool if he thinks he can make any kind of a peace with Zoo. I heard from your soldiers he was on the verge of making peace when you fired. Oh, Kathy, you're talking like a child. Peace isn't possible with the Apaches. I believe it is. Russell's right, Kathy. Don't quarrel with him over something silly like this. Do you think it's silly, Russell? Well, I just don't think it's as important as you do. Russell, I'm afraid we've made a mistake. Here's your ring. Kathy. You don't mean that, Kathy. I do mean it. Captain Edler. Jeff. I guess that puts us on equal footing now. Equal footing? To put a ring on a finger. Why, you insolent... As a matter of fact, Russell, as far as I'm concerned, you're not on equal footing with anyone. It was several weeks before I was on my feet again. When it was time to go, Kathy walked out and watched me saddle my horse. She was strangely quiet, but finally she said, I'll miss you. I'll be back. My father and Russell believe that you're the leader of the gun runners. Yes. They think that that's why you were able to go in the canyon and talk to Zoo. Kathy, how did I get out of that canyon, you know? I'm sure your captain didn't save me. A sergeant named O'Grady brought you out. Uh, wonder why Zoo didn't kill me. He certainly had every chance. And in his mind, every reason. Well, that's another thing that makes him... Kathy, you know very little about me. And yet I ask you to trust me. I do trust you. That's all I want to hear. If you're not running the guns, then who is? That's what I intend to find out. Have you any idea Yes, at all? I have an idea. But I've got to be sure. Goodbye, Kathy. You will be back. I'll be back. I found what I wanted to know all too soon and easier than I'd anticipated. I went back to town late that night just to look around. As I came between the buildings walking towards a hotel, I heard voices from the back of Norris's store. I flattened myself beside the window and I listened. I'm telling you, Norris, I don't like Carl moseying around the way he's doing. He's liable to stumble onto something. Russell, you've just got it in for Carl because of Kathy. I'm telling you to forget him. What can he do to us? I want to know who he is and what he knows and what he was doing in that canyon. I think we're safe enough. Uh, look, Norris, I've got to have a little money. Can I get 500 against the next shipment? You'd better watch yourself with those gambling debts, Russell. If you get in trouble again, I'm not helping you. If they go to the colonel about me, you're in the soup too, you know. If anyone goes to the colonel about you, Russell, you aren't going to be alive when the colonel gets to you. 
Now, come on. Let's lock up and get out of here. So now I knew for sure who the gun runners were. But what was I going to do about it? I went back to pay another call on the colonel. Colonel, I want to be assigned as a scout to Captain Edler's battalion. You're assigned. And I want the battalion ordered to the position I've shown you on the map. I want another chance to talk to Zoo. Well, what about the gun runners, Jeff? The gun runners will be taken care of once I've talked to Zoo. I wanted to see what had happened when Edler came face to face with Zoo. He'd fired on the Apaches when I'd gone in to talk to them, but I was sure now that he'd done it to make the Apaches think they were being fired on by followers of mine. But now he was leading his own battalion. He had to give his hand away. I didn't think that he'd fire on Zoo and run any risk of killing the goose that laid the golden egg. So at dawn, we waited on the plateau I designated. As the sun began to rise, Zoo and his men walked towards us. Edler turned to me. Well, Jeff Cole, this is the moment you waited for, isn't it? Yes. Did the colonel send you to spy on me? See if I was making deals with the Indians? I thought you said I was a gun runner. I still say it. Men! Wait till I get close and then open fire! Uh, open fire? You can't do that. We'll never have peace in this family. I give the orders here, Mr. Cole. Run, Sue! They're gonna fire on you! Run! Open fire! <laughs> followed a trail of blood up the mountain in search of Zoo. And at last I found him, in a cave on the utmost peak. He was wounded and spent. I was wounded too, but his needs were greater than mine. At first, Zoo turned a look of cold, trapped hate upon me. And then as I came closer, his gaze softened. Friend, you are friend. You tried to save the life of Zoo. Yes, let me look at your wounds. No. Zoo, come here to die. No, your wounds will heal. No, Zoo is old. The old die, the young live. When eagle falls, he cannot rise. You can rise. You must, Zoo. The white man who betrayed you, Russell Edler, he's dead. He was killed by your braves. But you will not die, Zoo. You will live to guide your people into the ways of peace. Your people need you. What can Zoo do for his people? You can talk to the white chief who is honest and kind, and who understands the problems of your people. Together, you'll arrive at a plan. The world of Zoo comes to an end. But you must help your people into a new world, where they can live with the white man. Can Apache live in this new world? You can if you help make such a world. You can if you live. Will you talk to my chief? When you first come to talk to Zoo of peace, I think you come to betray me. But today, you saved my life. Maybe you are right. Maybe we can learn to live together. Get some mud for my wounds. Zoo will talk to your chief. And so at last, Chief Zoo and Colonel Burnside sat down together to talk of peace in Doubtful Valley. And I went back to find Kathy. Jeff, I don't know what to say about my father and Russell. I had no idea they were the gun runners. I know, Kathy, and you've got to try to put it all behind you. The past is finished and done with. What matters now is the future. Our future. I'm going to build us a ranch out there at the foot of those mountains. And we're going to settle down and watch the East come out here to meet us. Do you think the East will come clear out here? You bet I do. The East will be coming west on horseback, by wagon train, in time even by railroad. This country's going to grow in the next few years, Kathy. And we're going to be a part of its growing. That is, uh, if you'll have me. If I'll have you. Oh, Jeff. Jeff. Darn. And so it was that the Apache and the white man at last began their efforts at mutual understanding. And war and bloodshed were replaced by the good, fruitful days of peace. And Kathy and I settled down with all the rest to life and love and peace in Doubtful Valley. Richard Woodmark 
Dr. James Hilton will return in a moment. You know, the tradition of giving May baskets is one of the most beautiful that's been handed down to us. Children left a basket filled with wildflowers on the doorstep of a friend's house, shouted, May basket, and waited for the friend to find it. It was a custom that taught them love and kindness, and one that they looked forward to every May day. Now your children can enjoy this beautiful custom, for May baskets are back. Yes, this year you'll find Hallmark May baskets of springtime beauty and freshness at fine stores where you regularly buy Hallmark cards. Youngsters fill them with candy and flowers to brighten the day of a friend, loved one, or someone who is sick. Hallmark May baskets come in a package containing five different basket designs. They're all cut out and ready for the children to put together. No scissors, no paste needed. The price? Only 50 cents for the complete package of five. Surely a most inexpensive way to let the children understand the real meaning of May Day as it has been celebrated for centuries. Remember, ask for the new Hallmark May baskets at fine stores across the country. You'll know the package by that familiar Hallmark and crown, the same symbol of quality you always look for on the back of a card when you carry enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Richard Widmark, you were excellent in your role of Jeff tonight. Thanks for visiting our Hallmark Playhouse. It was an exciting role to play, Mr. Hilton. You know, I always enjoy my visits to the Hallmark Playhouse, and I usually learn something, too. Those new Hallmark May baskets sound like a good idea. We think many children will enjoy them, and we'll be happy to see that any little friends of yours receive a set. Thanks, I know they'll like them. And now, what are you having next week? Next week on the Hallmark Playhouse, we shall dramatize a novel by Charlotte Bronte. Its title is The Professor. And as our star, we are happy to welcome back Joan Fontaine. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our producer-director is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our script tonight was adapted by Gene Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. Richard Widmark appeared tonight through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox Film Corporation, producers of With a Song in My Heart, a Technicolor production. The role of Kathy tonight was played by Loreen Tuttle, and Ted DeCorsia was Chief Zoo. Others in our cast were Gerald Moore, Ed Begley, Ted Osborne, Lamont Johnson, and Herb Ellis. You are invited to the Hallmark Hall of Fame every Sunday afternoon on television. Consult your paper for time and station. Your Red Cross is calling for an additional $10 million emergency fund to meet the human needs of the victims of the present Missouri flood area. Please be generous. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Joan Fontaine in Charlotte Bronte's The Professor and the week following R.D. Blackmore's Lorna Doone starring David Niven. And the week after that, Elizabeth Mumford's Whistler's Mother on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.